All right. I'm really looking forward to sharing this presentation with all of you. And I'm thankful for the questions that came up, um, some really interesting ones that that you all posed. So um, I'm, I've am i got some answers embedded in this, and then I also uh, have some special answers for a couple of the questions as well. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started for us. Um, so here I am. You've already heard about me, so I won't go too much into detail, but this is the course that I've taken. I've I moved progressively further north uh, throughout my career. I was born in Chicago um, and then did vet school at Wisconsin, made my way up here, and then went down south. And now I'm back here where I plan to be permanently and in my role as a neurologist and a neurosurgeon, and then uh, ultimately to become the director of the uh, Brain Tumor Clinical Trial Program here at the Veterinary Medical Center. What we'll cover today is mostly a summary of canine brain tumors. And with that, we'll talk about from start to finish, what the tumor types are, what our breed distribution is, our age distribution, so who gets these tumors and what type. We'll talk through the clinical signs that we see, meaning what would you observe at home and what will we observe on an examination that makes us concerned that a brain tumor might be affecting a dog. We'll talk through how we diagnose these brain tumors and then how we treat them. After we talk through all of the primary, you know, really important nuts and bolts of brain tumors in dogs, I'm going to share with you our brain tumor clinical trial program that's underway here with the Veterinary Medical Center. And again, so for the first majority of our presentation actually is gonna be about these different tumor types. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So, Medicine is all about classifying things and then whittling down lists. And so we have lots of different tumor types to discuss. Ultimately, though, I'm going to limit the scope today to two different tumor types that we see. If we expand our view a little bit more, we can divide brain tumors in dogs into primary brain tumors and metastatic brain tumors. A primary brain tumor means that it's arisen from the brain itself. A metastatic brain tumor means that it has spread from elsewhere in the body. And there's about a 50-50 split between primary brain tumors and metastatic brain tumors. However, clinically, most of the time, primary brain tumors become more readily apparent, and metastatic brain tumors are often found in post-mortem investigations, so not necessarily causing the majority of the signs that a patient may be experiencing. They might have been euthanized for another reason, and then as an incidental finding, the brain tumors are found uh, as, as having spread from the primary tumor. So really the focus of today, primary brain tumors. The types of brain tumors that we see are predominantly meningiomas and gliomas. And so these are the two tumor types that I'm going to focus on today. There are many other tumor types, including pituitary tumors, ventricular tumors, meaning tumors that arise from the fluid cavity spaces in the brain. Granular cell tumors are another tumor type. They're pretty rare, but something we also see. And then a smattering of other rare tumors that are just beyond the scope of today. So going forward, we'll limit our discussion to meningiomas and gliomas. So to get us started, meningiomas are considered the most common brain tumor type in dogs. I put that in quotes because that is a statistic that's come out um, preceding the breed distribution that we have today. So snub-nosed dogs, which are called brachycephalic dogs, they have short noses. Those are becoming really popular. And as those breeds become more popular, the breeds that get meningiomas are becoming less popular. And so although this is considered the most common tumor type, I would say that at this point, gliomas have dethroned meningiomas as the most common tumor type. Meningiomas arise from the protective coating surround the brain, surrounding the brain. And so um, we've, you may or may not have heard of something called the dura mater. That is one of the layers of the protective coating that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. There are a couple of other layers that are deeper to that. And those layers are what cause a brain tumor in the form of a meningioma. These tumors typically affect what we consider long-nosed dog breeds. So dog breeds like um, Labrador retrievers, golden doodles, border collies, and then the far right um, in the bottom right-hand side of the screen, that's a rat terrier. That's another breed that I've seen meningiomas in a little bit more frequency than the general patient population. 
These are usually adult dogs. Generally, they're at least eight years old when their tumor develops, as young as six, but usually eight and beyond. This image here is an MRI, and we're looking at a dog's brain from the side. This is the where the nose would be. You can see my arrow, hopefully. So the left-hand side of the image is where the, the nose would be. The right-hand side of the image would be facing towards the neck. The top of the image is the top of the dog's head and the bottom of the image is the dog's chin. And what I hope all of you can see is that there is this bright, what I would call well-defined, meaning it's easy for me to spot and it's easy for me to distinguish from the surrounding tissue, a well-defined mass in the front part of this dog's brain. Meningiomas tend to have what's called a broad base, meaning that because they originate from the protective coating and grow inward, their base is relatively large. So they take up a large amount of real estate um, in the periphery of the brain rather than inside the brain itself. Contrastingly, gliomas are considered a common brain tumor type in dogs, and I would argue at this point are more common than meningiomas. And that's because of the evolution of breed popularity that we're currently experiencing. Gliomas typically affect brachycephalic breeds. These are dogs that have short noses. Think of boxers, Boston Terriers, French Bulldogs, and Bulldogs. And these are the four most commonly affected dog breeds to develop gliomas, although any dog breed can develop a glioma. And these are also usually adult dogs, typically around eight years of age. Sadly, tends to be something that will affect a French Bulldog younger in life than the average other dog. And then also younger boxers have a higher risk. So for me, a boxer six and older who's started to develop seizures, I'm quite concerned, uh, might have a, a glioma. French Bulldogs as young as three can have gliomas arise. The MRI image here is showing you what a glioma looks like. Although it's in the same location as a meningioma compared to what I showed you on the last slide, it has some different imaging characteristics. And this is a T1 post contrast image. So what that means is that we have administered um, a, a compound that will illuminate abnormal areas in the brain. And unlike the meningioma, which we saw in the last slide, which was diffusely contrast enhancing, this one is called rim enhancing. So it almost looks like there is a ring all around the periphery of this tumor. And that is a very classic enhancement pattern for gliomas. It also doesn't have the same broad base as what we see in a meningioma. And there are other imaging sequences that we can do that would help us further heighten our suspicion that this is a glioma in this case. Regardless of the tumor type, brain tumor clinical signs will be the same. It doesn't really matter if it's a meningioma or a glioma or another tumor type. And that's because the neurologic exam will determine what location in the brain is abnormal but it does not tell you what is causing that part of the brain to be abnormal. So your veterinarian will perform a neurologic exam to localize the lesion. This is a very common phrase that neurologists use. They'll ask, where's the lesion? Did you localize to this part of the nervous system or this part? And the neuro exam's focus is to localize the lesion. There are three brain locations that we think of as lesion localizations. The first is the prosencephalon, which is pictured here. This is the big meaty part of the brain. It contains the cerebrum, right, which is what's involved in all of our personality, generation of thought, et cetera. So this part of the brain can certainly develop seizures. The cerebellum is back here. And the cerebellum is what's involved in fine tuning our movements, can also be an origin of tumors. And finally, we have the brainstem. And the brainstem is involved in all of our critical things for life. So breathing, heartbeat, basic physiologic processes to keep us alive, among many other things. So what do we observe in dogs that have brain tumors? Ultimately, what we observe depends on the tumor location. Uh, and that's because the region that's affected can only respond in one way, and that's to be neurologically abnormal to that, that site. And each of the brain regions that we see have very distinct examination findings that will help us to localize the lesion to that region of the brain. And then if it's a brain tumor, we would see 
abnormalities on our exam, but we wouldn't be able to tell you just based off of our exam that a tumor is our main differential at that point. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is that for dogs with tumors in the prosencephalon, which is that big meaty part of the brain that I talked about, seizures are often a first clinical sign, meaning that they are otherwise neurologically normal, they're interactive with you, they sail through their neuro exams, they don't have any overt abnormalities. Often over time, they will have neurologic deficits that develop and progress over a period of days to weeks. The sneaky thing about brain tumors is that sometimes dogs go from being completely normal to abnormal. And that's because at some point, the brain just can no longer tolerate the effects of the tumor, and that's when they start to show clinical signs. But in general, brain tumors cause progressive signs over time, meaning they're not suddenly really abnormal, they just get more abnormal over time. I'm going to show you examinations um, that localize to each of the three regions that we talked about. We'll first talk about a brain tumor affecting the cerebellum. I'm not sure why my video is giving us trouble. Hmm. Let's try that again. Okay, let's see. You can do a video. Oh, I don't know. That's going to be really hard for all of you to watch. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry for that technical difficulty. I think we're going to have to forgo the videos. Um, instead, what I will tell you is I'll just describe what this dog looks like. So this dog having a lesion in the cerebellum looks really... Um, exaggerated in all of her movements. And so instead of having really fine tuned gait, she's really sharp and choppy as she's walking around. She also sways from side to side because she's off balance. And if you hold the treat up to her nose, she develops something called an intention tremor, meaning that she bobs her head. These are the telltale signs of a problem in the cerebellum. This is an uncommon tumor location, but nonetheless an area where we can see tumors arise. Tumors in the brainstem will lead to a different set of characteristic uh, findings on their exam. Let's see if this one wants to behave. Yeah, looking like a no on that one as well. Again, I will just describe it to you. So this patient is stumbling consistently to one side. So every time he's walking, he falls over. Uh, consistently, he'll fall over to his left. He also has a left-sided head tilt, meaning that his eyes are no longer parallel to the floor. He tilts his head when he's walking. And then when he is look, when his head is examined, he has these abnormal eye movements where his eyes will be darting without his, his head moving. That's called a nystagmus, and that's an abnormal thing for the eyes to be doing. If the head is still, the eyes should also be still. And these are telltale signs of a problem in the brainstem. Again, for all of these lesion localizations, these specific findings do not point to a brain tumor. They point to a problem in the brain, and that problem in the brain may be arising from a brain tumor or from something else. The final lesion localization, and probably the one that's most important to talk about because it's the most common tumor localization or location, is the prosencephalon, which is that big meaty part of the brain. Oftentimes seizures are the only clinical sign in these patients, but sometimes they can go on to have other neurologic signs. So signs to watch for at home for a dog with a prosencephalic tumor would be that they will aimlessly pace and circle consistently in one direction over and over again. They will have full control over their limbs, but it'll almost be like they don't recognize that the other half of their world exists meaning that in some cases you might offer a plate of food and they will only eat from one side of the bowl. They also have difficulty recognizing where their limbs are. And so when we put them through a barrage of tests on their neuro exam, they fail to show us that they recognize where their feet are on one side and one side alone. So those are the signs that we look for on our neuro exam to localize to the prosencephalon. So I think that this is an important question to consider regarding seizures and brain tumors. And so one important question to consider is, do seizures always mean a dog has a brain tumor? And the answer is emphatically no. 
age and breed do matter when we are considering whether or not a patient might have a brain tumor. There are many other causes of seizures that we should be considering um, in addition to brain tumors. But ultimately, when we are building what's called our differential diagnosis list, we might include a tumor on our list, but it could be really likely in one dog breed and one breed, a dog of a certain age, but really unlikely in another one. So this is a good ju juxtaposition to show you. A young Australian shepherd is the poster child for epilepsy. And so epilepsy would be a much more likely cause of an Australian shepherd's seizures than a brain tumor, unless they get to a certain age. Contrastingly, in an older boxer, a brain tumor would be much more likely than epilepsy, just knowing what we know about how brain tumors arise in different dog breeds and of different ages. So then the other thing to consider is, well, how do we decide what differentials to include? And so the question here is, do signs of brain disease always mean a dog has a brain tumor? And the answer here is no. The neurologic exam will localize the lesion, but will not tell you the cause of the lesion. Um, so I think of it kind of like, I'm, I'm able to tell you where the problem is with my exam, but not what the problem is. Each brain region can only react in one way to disease. It does not matter what the underlying disease is. The brain will show the classic signs of that localization, regardless of what's causing the problem. So what we do as veterinarians is we create differential diagnoses lists to consider all possible causes. And we'll rank them from most likely to least likely, depending on the history that you provide us with, the age and breed of your dog, and where we're localizing the lesion. This is a question that I get a lot, and it's a really good question. And that's what causes brain tumors in dogs. And it really boils down to that it it's mostly bad luck. There are certain breeds that have a much higher risk of developing brain tumors. So without a doubt, genetics play a major role, but it's a really complicated question to answer. Importantly, there are no established correlations between brain tumors and diet, meaning that there are no foods that have been demonstrated to cause brain tumors. There are also no preventative diets that can keep a dog from developing a brain tumor. There are no established links between environmental exposures to various chemicals and the development of brain tumors. And there is no established correlation between brain tumors and other diseases. But there is a lot of new research coming out on the gut microbiome and its impact on brain tumors. But not necessarily to say that changes in the gut microbiome cause brain tumors, just that there is an interesting dynamic occurring between these two regions. So the approach to diagnosing a brain tumor is to first observe that there are clinical signs consistent with brain disease create your neuroanatomic localization, and then it's up to us to provide you with diagnostic options. I will usually at this point say that we could go one of two ways. We can proceed with a brain MRI and a cerebral spinal fluid tap, or we can use what I refer to as time as a diagnostic test. A brain MRI will provide the best route for diagnosis in the sense of it will be the fastest route and it is the most specific way for us to tell you what's affecting your dog. Brain tumors are readily identifiable and readily distinguishable from other abnormalities that we can see in the brain. Tumors look a very specific way compared to something like an infection in the brain, for example. Most brains don't look like other possible diseases, but in, in circumstances where we're not totally sure what we're, we're seeing, that's the reason for the cerebral spinal fluid tap because that can give us a microscopic evaluation of the brain and that can help us to decide if it's a brain tumor or something else. Brain tumors generally do not cause a lot of changes on our cerebral spinal fluid analysis, whereas other differentials may cause changes on our cerebral spinal fluid analysis. So this is the, the standard and fastest way for us as practitioners to provide you with an answer to what is causing your dog's clinical signs. So then what's this time as a diagnostic test? So this applies to dogs with a new onset of seizures, meaning that they're totally normal in between their seizures. In these cases, it still is good practice to do an MRI to determine the cause of the dog's seizures, but I totally recognize and understand that an MRI is sometimes not possible 
maybe for financial or logistic reasons, or maybe it's just not desired. Maybe it's just something that a family elects not to pursue for any respectable reason. So in these cases, monitoring for neurologic signs may help to decipher the differential diagnosis list. For example, if you have a six-year-old dog who has a new onset of seizures, if your dog has epilepsy, then your dog will remain neurologically normal for the rest of its life. If, however, your dog's seizures have originated from a brain tumor, eventually, usually within six months of the onset of the seizures, your dog will start to show neurologic signs at home in the form of aimless circling, inattention to one side of the world, and a personality change. If those things occur, then some problem inside the brain, and most likely it's a brain tumor, are the underlying cause of that dog's seizures and neurologic abnormalities. There are some other diagnostic tests that we will sometimes do to help whittle down other differentials off of our list, but there are no blood tests or other types of imaging like chest x-rays or anything like that that would be able to tell us if a dog has a brain tumor. We are using these other diagnostic tests to rule out some of the other differentials we may have on our list. Sometimes medication trials can help in the form of maybe we'll try a medication like a steroid and see if that improves the clinical signs. Um, but that won't necessarily tell us for sure that it's a brain tumor because there are other diseases that can also respond to steroids. But these are some uh, alternative paths to take when an MRI and a cerebral spinal fluid tap are not elected. Here is our approach to treating canine brain tumors. This is what I consider the standard approach at this point. We have two big things to consider. We have treatment that's directed at the tumor, meaning that we are directly targeting it. And we have treatment of the secondary effects from the tumor. And in both of these treatment types, prednisone is involved in helping to reduce some of the clinical signs associated with the tumor. So let's talk about tumor-directed therapy first. This is also referred to as definitive therapy, and there are broadly three standard definitive therapies available for brain tumors in dogs. There's surgical resection, there's radiation therapy, and to some extent, there's chemotherapy. So pictured here is TEAM uh, Veterinary Medical Center. Um, there are two board certified surgeons in this picture. There is actually a dentist in this, sur in this surgery as well. And then there's myself. Um, and we were operating on a tumor um, that actually we were uh, accessing from the mouth, hence the dentist. Um, but anyways, this is just to give you kind of a, a peek at what it looks like when we are doing brain surgery in dogs. It's a, it's a, you know, many people there um, scrubbed in and, and, you know, trying to address this tumor as safely as we can. So that is an option for treating brain tumors. And the middle image is showing you what it's like to plan a radiation therapy um, protocol for a dog. And so this is a CT, a CAT scan of a dog's brain. And you'll see that it looks like one of those satellite maps. And what this essential satellite map is showing you is these are different regions that they will provide different doses of radiation depending on how much they want to give to the tumor versus the surrounding tissue. So the goal with radiation therapy being to target the tumor as much as you can and spare the surrounding tissue. So this is what it looks like when a radiation oncologist is planning a dose for a patient. And then this is just a cute little picture of an Australian shepherd about to administer his own chemotherapy. This is definitely not up to code. We'll talk about surgical resection first. The goal here is to remove as much of the tumor as possible. And I think it's important to recognize that there are many circumstances or instances where we won't be able to remove all of the tumor tissue. And what that means is that tumor is left behind. The goal of surgery is to reduce the tumor burden so that the brain has more time to recover. We are really careful though, that there is a fine line be between removing too much tumor and potentially causing harm to the brain. So we have to weigh that in every single case that we're doing to make sure that we don't cause any undue complications for the sake of removing the tumor. We like to perform a post-operative MRI following our surgery so that we can determine the extent of the resection. That can help us with deciding, you know, how quickly do we think it's going to grow back? Does the brain look like it did well during the surgery? Questions like that. There are many benefits and drawbacks when we're considering surgery. These are just some of my preliminary thoughts. 
Surgery benefits are that this is the way to provide immediate tumor elimination and reduction. So in dogs that have really bad headaches from their tumors, which we presume they're having because they look like they have headaches, they walk into walls and say, ah, oh, my head hurts, or they have a, a rapid deterioration in their neurologic status, surgery might be a beneficial thing for them to alleviate the acute progression of their disease. And it's just one way to get rid of as much tumor as possible, as quickly as possible. Surgery also provides us with a way to get a biopsy so we can tell you exactly what tumor type your dog has and how severe it is in, term of, in terms of grading it. It also provides a platform for other treatments in the form of if we're doing some sort of a clinical trial, surgery is often the first start or the first step in performing a clinical trial in dogs. And dogs do amazingly well. Uh, and I, I just want to say that that is something that we have observed in the brain tumor clinical trial program here. And I just want to give a nod to Dr. Liz Pluhar um, because she, among a handful of other surgeons in the country, has really pioneered how we do brain surgery in dogs and has made it so that it's an established protocol here. And in a way that preceding her really extensive dedication to this field was unprecedented. Um, so I just want to express some gratitude her way for what she's done for these patients and making this so that brain surgery is not rocket science for us anymore. The drawbacks of surgery are that complications can and do occur. And I think it's really important that um, pet owners are aware that this is, it's a complicated procedure and the brain um, is a very sensitive organ. So we need to be prepared that sometimes there are some unwanted complications that can arise. They can have neurologic deficits after surgery, which may be temporary or can be permanent. Surgery is expensive. It does require an experienced neurosurgeon. Not every neurosurgeon will perform brain surgery. And it's not a standalone treatment for gliomas, as we'll get into in a little bit. Radiation therapy for brain tumors, switching gears and talking about that instead of surgery at this point, uh, is a really useful treatment option for brain tumors for the majority of the tumor types that we see. There are two broad types of radiation therapy. I'm not going to get into the differences right now. Ultimately, whatever a radiation oncologist recommends is generally the right one to pursue. There are benefits and drawbacks to the two different types of radiation therapy that we pursue. The goal here is to gradually kill tumor cells. Radiation therapy benefits, benefits include that the treatment is patient-tailored, meaning that the dose delivered is specific to that patient. It's safe and well-tolerated in most dogs. And it is a useful standalone treatment for most tumor types, including gliomas, which is different than surgery. And it's also becoming more widely available. The drawbacks of radiation therapy are that it does require daily anesthesia for anywhere between five and 20 days, depending on the type of radiation therapy recommended. You are also going in and treating disease without confirmation of what you're treating. So we don't get biopsies before radiation therapy as standard care right now, meaning that sometimes we don't know for sure if we're radiating a tumor or not. It is expensive. I would say it's slightly more expensive than surgery at this point. And it can rarely cause delayed toxicity. And usually what happens there is that dogs will develop neurologic deficits in the months to years that follow their radiation therapy. The other drawback is that there is lots of protocol variability, which means that it can be difficult for us to translate study findings into what we can prepare you for as, a, as an individual uh, pet owner. We'll just summarize chemotherapy for canine brain tumors as it just is really not an effective treatment for bra most brain tumor types. This is different than in human brain tumors where chem chemotherapy is a mainstay of therapy for brain tumors. There are a handful of situations in which we may prescribe chemotherapy, like in the case of a meningioma, occasionally I will prescribe a medication uh, for meningiomas. Uh, lymphoma is another one that responds to chemotherapy, as well as various metastatic brain tumors. But the reason that chemotherapy doesn't work well in dogs is what this little schematic is showing you here, which is the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier's job is to keep compounds out of the brain and it keeps chemotherapy out really well. So chemotherapy just doesn't make its way into the dog brain very well, which is why we don't use it for brain tumors. Prednisone makes its way into brain tumor treatment for any of the dogs that we see. Um, and the reason why is because it reduces inflammation associated with the tumor. It can also potentially slow tumor growth, but I wouldn't 
hang my hat on that as a, as a treatment plan per se. Generally, we'll start prednisone for any brain tumor patient that has neurologic abnormalities because the prednisone can help reduce those neurologic abnormalities. Prednisone as a sole therapy constitutes what we call palliative therapy when definitive therapy is not pursued. And so in this case, we would be using prednisone without doing surgery or radiation therapy to give a dog some prolonged good quality of life, but not necessarily to the same extent as they would get with definitive therapy. The benefits of prednisone is that it works really quickly to reduce neurologic dysfunction. So often within just a day or two of starting to receive the medication, they'll start to feel better. It is safe and well tolerated in most dogs and the dose can be easily adjusted. And prednisone is really inexpensive. You're probably looking at about $20 to medicate a large breed dog um, for a month. The drawbacks of prednisone are that it can cause increased thirst, urination, and appetite. Some people report that it makes them really agitated. So dogs probably experience the same thing. It is not safe to give with some other medications. So we just have to make sure we know what medications your pet is on before we prescribe it. It can cause stomach ulcers if it's given um, in too high of a dose, and it causes weight gain and ironically muscle loss at the same time. And it does require a taping, tapering plan if we are going to discontinue it. So this is not a medication we would want you to just stop on your own. We would want you to consult with us before you would do that. We'll move on to treating the secondary effects of brain tumors. And so everything we just talked about was treating the tumor itself. Prednisone is one that kind of teeters on the edge of treating the primary tumor itself and then treating secondary effects. So now we're going to transition into talking about treating the secondary effects of the brain tumors. The biggest secondary effect of brain tumors is that they can cause seizures if the brain tumor is in the prosencephalon. And so any dog that's having seizures as a result of a brain tumor needs to be put on an anticonvulsant or what's called an anti-epileptic. You might've heard it referred to as that as well. And there are four current options that we have. And those options are phenobarbital, potassium bromide, zanisamide, and levetiracetam. There are a couple others out there, but they really don't work well. So I don't prescribe them or they're just not available for us yet, but are available overseas and work well overseas. So one day, maybe they will come our way. The tricky thing when we're prescribing anticonvulsants is that the perfect anticonvulsant just does not exist. We have a trade-off when we're prescribing the medications. The drugs that tend to work better, meaning phenobarbital and potassium bromide, come with more side effects than the drugs that don't work as well, meaning zanisamide and levetiracetam. My logic is that given that these dogs have a primary reason for their seizures in the form of a brain tumor, that means that they are at risk for a more severe presentation of their seizures and also at higher risk for death from their seizures than a dog that's epileptic, for example. And so I tend to reach for phenobarbital first because I know that it is, it is the most effective anti-seizure medication that we have. And I wanna do everything I can do to prevent your pet from having a seizure that uh, it does not come out of. And therefore phenobarbital would be my preferred choice over something like levetiracetam, for example, which has just not been demonstrated to work as well in preventing seizures as phenobarbital. In addition to anti-seizure medication, anxious patients may also receive an anti-anxiety medication. Dogs with brain tumors sometimes get confused because the tumor is pushing on the part of their brain that allows them to process thoughts normally, and that can lead to them being really anxious. And so in cases where I think that a patient is distressed by their condition, I will pres excuse me prescribe a safe anti-anxiety medication for them. So those are the mainstays of treating the secondary effects of brain tumors in our patients. Let's transition now to talking about the prognosis for canine brain tumors. I think to set the stage for this, there are a number of different ways that we can prognosticate brain tumors in dogs. There are different survival times based off of the tumor type. So for example, a meningioma has a different survival time than a glioma. We can also think about survival times relative to the tumor location. So for example, a tumor in the prosencephalon, the big meaty part of the brain, those dogs tend to live longer than dogs that have a tumor in their brainstem. And we can think about different survival times by treatment. So did the dog receive definitive treatment or palliative treatment? The ways that survival times are provided um, is either in what are called median or mean overall survival time, median or mean progression-free survival, 
and Kaplan-Meier curves or percent survival. These are all uh, population statistics. So for example, the median or mean overall survival time means that there was a population of dogs and they assessed essentially what was the middle value for how long those dogs lived. What that means is that there were some dogs that lived a shorter period of time than that average, and there were some dogs that lived a longer period of time. And all of those numbers for that population come together to create that average. A Kaplan-Meier curve is a way that oncologists primarily will assess response to treatment or survival over time. And I will show you some Kaplan-Meier curves that basically show response to treatment in patients with brain tumors. So to get us started, we'll talk about the prognosis for canine meningiomas, and I have broken it up by the different types of therapy that we have for them. So we'll actually start in the bottom right-hand corner with palliative care. I'll remind you that this means treating them with steroids, and the median survival time here for dogs that are treated with steroids um, is 180 days for prosencephalic tumors. What that means is that if they have a meningioma in the front half of their brain, with prednisone alone, your dog may live 180 days. But again, that's a median survival time, meaning that some dogs don't make it to 180 days and some dogs exceed 180 days. But what's important to distinguish here is that the median survival time for dogs with prosencephalic tumors is much greater on average than the median survival time for dogs with tumors in the brainstem or the cerebellum. Those dogs, when treated with steroids alone, live on average about 30 days. So here, the location really matters when we're thinking about palliative care. The tumor type does not matter. So this would actually still apply for a glioma as well to some extent. But ultimately, with palliative care, tumor location plays a critical role in how long a dog will live when treated with steroids alone. Moving over to surgical resection in the left, the median survival time that's been reported in some studies looking at surgical resection alone as a treatment for meningiomas is about a year, 386 days. About 50% of dogs will survive less than a year, 25% live between one to two years, and 15% live beyond two to three years with surgery alone. Dogs with meningiomas that are treated with radiation therapy have a median survival time of 524 days. So actually a quite good response to radiation therapy for meningiomas. Just be aware that there is a wide range in protocols and that can influence the survival time for a given study, which is then difficult to translate to what it would mean for an individual patient. But in general, most of the studies that I have read and most of my personal experience is um, consistent with what's reported here. About a year with surgical resection, about 520 days with radiation therapy for meningiomas. Now we'll move on to gliomas. When we treat gliomas with palliative care, because these are really aggressive tumor types in dogs, the median survival time is about 30 to 60 days. Shorter for dogs with tumors in their brainstem and longer for dogs with tumors in their prosencephalon. But ultimately, because gliomas are really aggressive brain tumors in dogs, they just don't respond all that well to steroids alone. So unfortunately, a much shorter survival expectation for dogs with gliomas compared to meningiomas. With radiation therapy, the median survival time is 536 days. Again, beware that there's a wide range of protocols, but this is emerging evidence that's really encouraging for us because historically, anecdotally, we as a profession, we're not sure that gliomas responded all that well to radiation therapy in dogs. And there's been a lot of effort lately on the part of radiation oncologists and neurologists to debunk that and to say that actually gliomas in dogs do respond quite well to radiation therapy, just as well as meningiomas do. Surgical resection by itself is not a standalone treatment for gliomas in dogs. And this is because these tumors are in the brain themselves, meaning that I can say with as much certainty as I feel comfortable saying that I will not be able to get every tumor cell out in a glioma, meaning that if I just leave one behind, which I know I do, then that tumor will grow back. And that's the reason why surgery by itself is not an effective treatment for gliomas. So a couple of things to consider going forward. One, should we pick surgery or radiation therapy? These are Kaplan-Meier curves. And so I'm just gonna teach you what that means. 
And so on the x-axis, we have survival time in days for both of these studies. In the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve on the left, you'll see that survival time goes all the way out to around 3,000 days. And then the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right goes out to 2,000. So pretty similar in terms of how far out these studies were looking. And then on the y-axis, we have cumulative survival, meaning percent. So um, it goes up to one is 100%. And so what this means is that at each of these time points, how many of the dogs in the study were still alive? And the lines that you're seeing represent the patient groups over time. The left Kaplan-Meier curve is showing the survival in dogs that were treated with surgery alone and dogs that were treated with surgery alone with gliomas are in green, and dogs treated with surgery alone with meningiomas are in blue. Each vertical line that you see is a death. And so what I think we can all appreciate is that for the gliomas, there is a sharp decline in survival immediately following surgery. So this is further evidence to show you that surgery by itself is not a standalone treatment for gliomas. On the other hand, if you look at the meningioma curve, there is certainly some decline in survival over time, but it's much less of a steep decline than for the gliomas. And so this means that surgery by itself is a reasonable treatment option for a meningioma, but not a glioma. On the radiation therapy figure, which is on the right, you can see that the glioma and meningioma curves pretty much mirror each other. And so what that means is that radiation therapy is, in my opinion, an equally efficacious treatment option for meningiomas and gliomas in dogs. So for me, what this means is that if I had to choose what to do, if I had a dog with a glioma, I would do radiation therapy. If I, if I could afford it and it was what I thought was best for my pet, I would not do surgery by itself because I think that that would just, it would come back really quickly. And with a meningioma, I might consider surgery or radiation therapy. Okay, so this brings us into a discussion that I have every single day with pet owners who love their dogs so much and are experiencing the worst possible thing that you can experience as a pet owner, which is your pet being sick. And the question is, but how long will my dog live? So this is something that I think about a lot um, because I think that we struggle, right, with this question because we want to provide you with an answer, but we struggle with this question because we just don't necessarily always know how to answer it for you. And that's because population statistics are not the same thing as individual statistics. So for example, a study saying that 80% of dogs live one year does not mean the same thing as this. It doesn't mean there's an 80% chance my dog will live one year, right? And that's because we're looking at average survival times, right? And so in order for an average to occur, there had to be dogs that did worse than that average and dogs that did better than that average. So what's my take on all of this? Here's my take on all of this. I think that what's important is to general, to understand the general survival tendencies by treatment. Okay, so for example, in general, dogs with meningiomas that are treated with radiation therapy live longer than dogs that are treated with steroids. Okay? Or for example, dogs with gliomas treated with surgery alone do worse than dogs treated with radiation therapy. So understand the general survival tendencies by treatment and then prepare yourself for the entire survival range. So meaning what does it look like if my dog gets the best response to this elected treatment possible and what's the worst, okay? And that, that basically allows us to say, okay, what's the shortest time that I would expect my dog to live with this treatment and what's the longest? Decide what option you are okay with accepting at its best and at its worst when you are considering what to do for your dog. And then logistically, things like cost and quality of life for you and your dog are very important when you're making these decisions. So that's essentially how I think about all of this is if, if I'm thinking about a decision for my own pet, generally, what can I expect and what's the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario? And given all of those considerations, what feels right to me for my pet and for myself? So in the right-hand side of the screen, I have for you just a little, um, I guess, like peek into my brain. So when I was thinking about all of this, I was like, I want some sort of an image to put in this presentation that helps me describe how I feel about all of this. And so I, I Googled, you know, how long do I have left? And this illustration came up of the, the hand-drawn flowers. 
And it said, we would tell you if we could. And um, that just really resonates with me as a clinician um, and also as a pet owner myself, um, who's been through what people are experiencing. I've, I've had a dog with a brain tumor myself. And so um, I've been on both sides of the table per se. And this image is from um, the New York Times and it was published in 2014. And I said, huh, I wonder who wrote this. And um, so I followed the link and it was written by um, this man, Dr. Paul Kalanithi, who um, has since passed away. Um, he was uh, a neurosurgery resident at the end of his training and is a fantastic writer and published this really great piece in 2014 in the New York Times entitled, How Long Have I Got Left? And included this illustration. And if you're looking for a really um, tear-jerking book, but one that I think is just so beautifully written and summarizes a lot of these considerations, this is the book that he wrote um, after he was diagnosed with, um, with lung cancer. Um, it's called When Breath Becomes Air. I think it's a fabulous read. And it summarizes a lot of my feelings as a clinician and as a patient myself in various situations. Um, so there you go. If you want an interesting read um, that will probably cause you to cry, this is a good book to read. And for me, that forms the, the um, segue into what I want to talk about next, which is, will we eradicate canine brain cancer? And this is a quote that also really resonates with me. And this was something that Bill Clinton said way back in 2000 when he was speaking on the Human Genome Project's progress. He excitedly said, it is now conceivable that our children's children will know the term cancer only as a constellation of stars. And it's been 24 years since he said that. And so, you know, time's a ticking, everybody, but we've made so much progress. And, um, you know, just in reference to this picture that I have here for you, is that, is that a realistic thing? Like, can we actually do that? I don't know, but shoot for the moon, you'll land amongst the stars, right? And so that's where we're going to now talk about what are we trying to do to advance canine brain tumor treatment? We know that canine gliomas are extremely aggressive. We also know that we have very few treatment options to provide to dogs and their families. The other thing is that the treatment options are all one size fits all. So it's like you either get surgery or you don't. You either get radiation therapy with a little bit of tailoring or you don't. But there's no real acknowledgement of how diverse these tumors are amongst themselves. The glioma of one dog is miles different from the glioma of another dog. And so there are many unexplored treatment targets and many unexplored opportunities to individualize our treatment approach to gliomas. Um, dogs have a really complex relationship with their gliomas. They have this co-evolution between the tumor and their tumor microenvironment, meaning that immune cells along the way, alongside the tumors are also changing. And so that's another, that's one area that we can focus on when we're talking about how we treat brain tumors. There's also a lot of heterogeneity within the tumors themselves, meaning that you could take a sample of the tumor at location X and then a, lo a, a, a sample at location Y, and the tumors genetically can look really different from each other, just even within the tumor itself. They have a really complicated blood-brain barrier, which is something that limits our ability to get medications in, but also is a therapeutic target if we can make it more amenable to receiving medications. And then really importantly, dogs have an intact immune system, meaning that when the dogs experience a tumor, their immune system does as well. And that is a relationship that we can exploit to try to bring the immune system into the fight against their tumors. And all of those considerations are the impetus for the University of Minnesota Canine Brain Tumor Program. And so at the center of this image, here we are, the College of Veterinary Medicine. We are home to the University of Minnesota Canine Brain Tumor Program. And this is a partnership with many places, many funding organizations. But I have here some examples of the people who we collaborate with to make the research happen. We work with members of the University of Minnesota Neurosurgery Department, Radiation Oncology, Pediatrics, the Masonic Cancer Center, and then the Brain Tumor Program nestled within the Masonic Cancer Center. And what we do is that we investigate innovative treatments for pet dogs who have spontaneous brain tumors. We mostly focus on gliomas because gliomas are so bad in dogs. And we focus on a variety of different strategies. Primarily right now, what we're looking at is immunotherapy-based treatments and sonodynamic therapy. 
pictured here are two of the three main members of the the day to day for the brain tumor program. Dr. Liz Pluhar is pictured here, and then the, that's me. Uh, but Dr. Liz Pluhar is the director of the brain tumor program. She's been doing this for 15 years. She has devoted her career to this, and um, as I said, has been a pioneer in bringing hope to people who have pet dogs with brain tumors. Not pictured here, but completely indispensable to the program is Sarah, who is a certified veterinary technician, and she is a coordinator for the Brain Tumor Clinical Trials Program. If you have worked at all with us, then you've likely met Sarah and interacted with her and know that she is delightful and is an integral member of our team. But there we are, day to day, that's who does the Brain Tumor Program. So I'm going to tell you about the immunotherapy clinical trial briefly. The rationale here is that, as I said, the immune system is critically involved in fighting against or being impacted by brain tumors. And gliomas will lead to both local and systemic immunosuppression. The problem there is that then the immune system can't partake in the fight against the tumor. So the rationale for what we do with our immunotherapy clinical trials is we provide therapies that activate the immune system such that it can take part in fighting off the tumor. What I'm picturing here is a little diagram to show you how this works. So we'll start in the top right-hand corner of the diagram on the left, and that's with a syringe. And what this syringe is injecting is something called an autologous tumor lysate vaccine and also an immune checkpoint inhibitor. What these two things do is they basically expose the dog's immune system to little bits of the tumor itself so that the immune system can say, hey, this is foreign, this is not acceptable to be in the body, we're gonna go after it and we're gonna go after it wherever it is present. And that means that it's present in the vaccine itself, which we administer underneath the skin and the neck, and it's present in the brain where we've left tumor tissue behind. So these little compounds get picked up by cells called dendritic cells, which are labeled as DC here. And dendritic cells are the messengers of the immune system. They will bring this message to a lymph node where it will interact with T cells, which go off to fight against the tumor. And those T cells are called CD4 positive T cells and CD8 positive T cells. So that's what I'm showing you here is that within a lymph node, we have activation of the immune system to go fight off the tumor. The way that we administered this treatment in dogs is that first and foremost, we remove their tumors as much as we safely can. We do a post-operative MRI, and then we create anti-tumor vaccines. So we take the dog's own tumor and from that, we create vaccines against their own specific tumor. This is the individualized treatment plan that I'm talking about in terms of creating patient-specific treatment for dogs with gliomas. We give the vaccines alongside something called an immune checkpoint inhibitor, which essentially um, activates the immune system so that it can take part in the fight against the tumor. And there's a very specific schedule that um, is provided when we do these injections. And then we do recheck MRIs every four months on the dogs to see how their tumors are responding with the hope that it's not growing back anytime soon. I wanted to show you some of what we've observed in our trials thus far. So these are Kaplan-Meier curves again. The image on the left is showing the data that we have from a pilot study that was done over 10 years ago now. This pilot study was the groundbreaking study that allowed us to say that what we're doing is working in these dogs. And the results from this pilot study then went on to be the impetus for a very large NIH-funded study that was a five-year study that wrapped up in 2023. The Kaplan-Meier curve on the left is showing you the response in dogs that were treated with tumor lysate alone, meaning just the vaccines, compared to dogs that received the tumor lysate plus the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And those dogs are shown in red. And so what you can see from this Kaplan-Meier curve is that there is a profound sur a survival benefit in the dogs that received a combination of the tumor lysate plus the immune checkpoint inhibitor. So adding that immune checkpoint inhibitor had a profound benefit in the survival of the dogs. So then what we did was we investigated several other different types of checkpoint inhibitors and other ways to activate the immune system. All of this mumble jumble, um, the, the um, add TK, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but these are different types of immune activation that we investigated to see if we could improve survival time in the dogs. 
And overall, what we're seeing is that, again, the dogs that received a combination of their tumor lysate and some other form of immunotherapy had a survival benefit over the dogs that received the tumor lysate alone. So if you look at these individual curves, you'll see that, for example, the dogs that got one version of the, the tumor lysate plus an immune checkpoint inhibitor in blue had up to about 200 day survival. There are other dogs that lived all the way out 500 days plus if they received a different form of immunotherapy. This is all to say that what we are doing is providing a survival benefit for the dogs. The overall survival that we're seeing in our clinical trials for immunotherapy is about 200 days compared to dogs that receive surgery alone, which is 66 days. So we are seeing a marked survival benefit when we combine the immunotherapy with surgery for these patients. 200 days is not as good as 500 days that we can see with radiation therapy, but 200 days is, in most of these cases, they're really good 200 days. So definite benefit over doing nothing alone, for example. So I told you about all the different people who are involved in the brain tumor program, and you may or may not be wondering, why is there so much interest in canine brain tumors? Aside from dogs just being delightful and maybe all these people have dogs and they want to help dogs. And there's some of that for sure. Uh, we are really lucky to work with a very enthusiastic and dynamic, diverse group of people. The reality is, though, that this is not something that just benefits dogs in doing this research. So what I wanted to tell you about now to end my presentation is a discussion of the similarities and the essential link between canine and human glioma. And I made these mirror images of each other in part because I really wanted to hone in on that um, analogy, but also because I actually don't know how to flip the words so that they're not backwards in full disclosure, but I thought that it still drove home the point effectively, which is that what we see in terms of the complexity of canine gliomas is mirrored in terms of the complexity of human gliomas. So human gliomas and canine gliomas share similar life histories, meaning that we tend to see them happening at the same stages of life. So older adult people get gliomas, older adult dogs get gliomas. They share similar genetic profiles, meaning that the same mutations, to a large extent, the same mutations that we see in canine gliomas are also seen in human gliomas, and they have similar tumor microenvironments. So I'm just going to quickly tell you about this um, to, to wrap things up, and that's just a discussion of glioblastoma multiforme. This is the most common primary brain tumor in people, and it's also the most deadly brain tumor in people. It has a median survival time of 14.6 months, and it has a five-year survival rate of 6.8%. In the past 30 years, we have seen six United States presidents. We've seen the development of the internet. Pluto is no longer a planet. We have self-driving cars, and I've counted this, there have been 14 The Land Before Time movies. In that same time period, in the last 30 years, there has been no change in human glioblastoma patient survival time. So all of these people here lived about the same exact time following their diagnosis of a glioblastoma. This is across political lines. So, you know, many of you likely recognize most of these people. Um, the one that most people tell me they don't know who this is, this is George Gershwin in the middle. He's my favorite composer, and he died of a glioblastoma. Um, and the person that most people also will not know is pictured on the far right, and um, this is my, my um, late friend, Curtis, who um, was um, a victim of a glioblastoma. So what I will say to conclude is that dogs and people need a cure for glioma. Um, we need to do everything we possibly can to try to make this a thing of the past. Um, and I don't know if it'll be in our children's children's time as Bill Clinton excitedly hoped for back in, 20, in, in 2000, but I think we keep striving for that. So pictured here are a variety of my patients who have participated in the clinical trial. We love all of them. And um, I think their little smiling faces say a lot. And um, so with that, I would like to tell you that you know, canine brain tumors are one of many causes of neurologic dysfunction in dogs. Their diagnosis does require an MRI. There are several treatment avenues that are available and continued research like we're doing in the brain tumor program will improve patient outcomes.
So I would like to thank all of you for listening to my presentation. And I'd like to thank all of my mentors, colleagues, patients, and their families for what they have done to help us help all of you. So thank you for your time. And I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Susan. That was a really thorough and really personal presentation. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Jump, jump right in with uh, some guest questions here. We'll sure. go a little over seven o'clock if guests would like to stay with us for some interesting questions. Uh, the first one we have here is a uh, question about early detection and seeing symptoms. At what point would you investigate uh, if searching for a tumor is the best option? Um, this person says their pet developed facial paralysis and was not able to close either eye, but had no other symptoms. This uh, developed after a bilateral infection. Um, they were thinking a brain tumor was possible. So just a question of at what point would you begin thinking about brain tumor? That is a really great question. And I guess I would say that there, there's a lot of nuances to answer that question. I think that, um, it's not necessarily ever too early to start looking for one. And also at the same time, the age and breed of the patient matters a lot. So for example, if those clinical signs in the form of facial weakness um, were seen in a, I'll just give you a guess, five-year-old Cocker Spaniel, for example, I would be really suspicious that it's not a brain tumor because I would be much more suspicious of an ear infection in that dog breed. As opposed to, let's say it was instead a 11-year-old American Staffordshire Terror, okay? Then I would be more suspicious of a brain tumor than of something else. So um, the tricky thing is that brain tumors can either cause an acute onset of clinical signs or they can lead to gradual clinical signs. And so that's why I'm saying that it's never really too early to look for it because they can just be really sneaky and when they rear their ugly head. Thanks, that's great. We have a question here about uh, treatment and similarities um, in humans and life expectancy. Are there treatment plans uh, for human brain tumors that mirror treatment plans for dogs? And is life expectancy any longer in canines versus humans with any of these tumors? That is a great question. So. The survival times that we see in dogs are pretty similar for um, gliomas. Meningiomas are a little different. Um, meningiomas and people, so I, I'm going to just start by saying I am not a human physician. And so I will do my best to answer this from a research standpoint. Meningiomas and people, not always, but more often are of a lower grade than they are in dogs. And so people with meningiomas can be cured of their meningiomas with surgery. Unfortunately, that's just not really what we see in dogs with meningiomas. And so in that regard, I think that um, the, the long-term survival is not the same for canine and human patients with meningiomas. For gliomas, yeah, they do quite similarly mirror each other. Treatment-wise, the ways that um, I actually don't know a ton about how they treat meningiomas in people because it's just not an area of my research. But um, in people, the standard therapy for treatment of gliomas is a combination of surgical removal, radiation therapy, and a chemotherapy called temozolomide. Um, and we've just not found that temozolomide is effective in treating brain tumors in dogs, gliomas specifically. Okay, thank you. Yeah. A question here is about the effectiveness of uh, certain treatments. Um, this person says that uh, they unfortunately had to put down their golden retriever as she had cancer, but albeit not brain cancer. Okay. So they're just wondering about, could you comment on the effectiveness of treatments for dogs with cancer in general? Um, in this case, the cancer spread aggressively, so aggressively that the treatment, any treatment was not even an option. Um, they had a very short amount of time after they discovered it. So just any comment. Yeah. That that sounds like a really sad experience to go through, and I'm sorry to whoever that was. Um, that sounds really difficult. So, the answer to that question start with starts with the the ans the the survival time treatment options, et cetera, are so specific to an individual cancer type. So the first thing that we will do as a veterinarian is try to tell you what type it is. That's the first thing that happens. So, what's the tumor type? And then after we've told you what the tumor type is, we do two things. We grade it and we stage it. Grading a tumor means how aggressive is the tumor itself. 
And there are a variety of ways that we can look at that. Um, how fast do the tumor cells divide? Is it causing other changes in the surrounding tissue? And so the grade of a tumor will impact its prognosis. Staging a tumor means determining how much it is spread. And so there are various stages to go through. Usually it's a st up to a stage four, and that'll tell you how much of the rest of the body is affected by the, the tumor type itself as it's spread throughout the body. Those two things will indicate the, you know, how, how, how long it will be before an animal will succumb to its disease and can also indicate the responsiveness to treatment. So some tumor types as what you experienced, they're so sneaky in what they do. And by the time they become evident, they're everywhere. And those tumor types often are not fantastic at responding to treatment. They can, but oftentimes they don't because they're just, they're discovered at such an advanced stage by no fault of anyone's, right? They just, they're really sneaky. There are other tumor types that are more slow growing and are more responsive to treatment, for example. So it's a really long answer to say that it's just a very complicated question and it depends entirely on the tumor type. Great, thank you. Yeah. Looks like we have uh, time for one more question here. Sure. Um, what excites you about the future of brain tumor treatments or research? Oh, what a delightful question. I think what excites me is that Well, there's a lot, but I think what really excites me is that we as a profession have so much buy-in at this point from other medical professions in terms of the, mm -hmm. the validity of the dog model. So, you know, I think what's really nice about that is that I have, I have human neurosurgeons who come to me and say, I want to try something. This is my life's work. I think it's going to be beneficial. I would really like to try it in your patients because I think that they would benefit from it. And I think that we would learn important things, not only to advance veterinary medicine, but also human medicine. So I think what really excites me about brain tumor research in dogs is that we are able to, because there is this recognition now that this is a really useful avenue to explore um, really seriously, is that it's opening up so many opportunities for us to provide new treatments for dogs and also then to apply those to not only help dogs, but also to help people.